first, I wanted to introduce our speaker. Um, so we're very excited to have Lamar Thornton. He is, is a cybersecurity engineer at Health First, which is a not-for-profit health insurer located in New York City. He received his undergraduate degree from Elizabeth City State University in criminal justice and his master's of science in cybersecurity risk and strategy from New York University. Lamar originally started in a desktop support role, which gave him experience in enterprise information technology. And it was at this time that he discovered his passion for cybersecurity, which led him to become a, a comp TIA certified person. His concurrent roles included an IT operations analyst and an IT support specialist, both of which provided him practical enterprise information security skills and led him to join the Office of Information Security at Health First. So in his current role, he works on the security architecture team, providing the necessary support in driving the mission of Health First Information Security Department. So I'll now turn it over to Lamar. Thank you. All right. Nice. Okay. So good e evening, everybody. Um, I just want to start off by saying thank you to Stephen and Jamie for putting this together. Um, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and I hope that you guys enjoy the information that I'm presenting. All right. So as was mentioned, I'm a cybersecurity engineer at Health First, I'm working on the architecture team, um, specializing in PAM, which stands for Privilege mm -hmm. Access Management. Um, privilege access management uh, basically encompasses managing anything that has the keys to the kingdom for an organization, right? Whether it's a service account, um, a secret, and that's diving into the technicals. Um, but, you know, we just basically manage and monitor the keys to the kingdom of organization when it comes to um, service accounts or anything of that nature, right? So diving right into the learning objectives, we have six. Um, first one, identify different types of cyber attacks as well as preventative and responsive measures. Number two, identify types of uh, threat actors as well as motivations, intentions, and methods of attack. Um, number three, develop a working knowledge of good cyber hygiene practices. I think that'll probably be one of the most interesting uh, learning objectives. Um, number four, implement cybersecurity best practices in a work and home environment. Number five, improve security of accounts, work or personal. That can include um, your standard work account that you use to access any of your email accounts or uh, applications or portals um, and personal accounts. That can be social media, bank accounts, um, anything that uh, revolves around your personal use uh, digitally, digitally um, for accounts. Um, and we're gonna improve the security, learn how to improve the security of those accounts by creating complex passwords and enabling multi-factor authentication. Those are two simple things that you can do as an individual or as an employee to um, improve the security of any of your accounts, right? Um, number six, um, I'm gonna speak to the importance of cybersecurity in health systems. All right, so what is cybersecurity? Um, CISA, which is the Cybersecurity and Infrastructure Security Agency, um, defines cybersecurity as the art of protecting networks devices and data from unauthorized access or criminal use in a practice of confidentiality, integrity, and availability, right? Those three terms make up what we call an information security, the CIA triad, right? Those three terms are the basis of cybersecurity for any organization or any program, right? Confidentiality uh, relates to secrecy, right? So the use of passwords, um, as an example, you can think of a patient entering a password to enter into a, a portal or a health portal, or um, thinking about using an ATM, you having a pin for a credit card or debit card, um, that relates to ensuring confidentiality. And there are different layers, um, what we call defense in depth, right? There are different layers that you can apply um, on top of passwords to ensure confidentiality or secrecy, right? Um, number two, integrity. Integrity ensures that data is not changed or altered over its entire life cycle. Um, the example given uh, prescription information is data sent from one provider to another or from one end to another, right? Um, we can even talk about email messages. If I send an email message to Steve, Stephen um, saying, hey, Stephen, I hope you have a great day. He opens the message up and it says, hey, I hope you have the worst day of your life, All right? Somewhere in between me sending the message and him receiving the message, the integrity of that message 
was compromised, right? So as cybersecurity professionals, we wanna be able to ensure that any information, whether it's at rest, meaning it's uh, usually backed up, or stored somewhere in transit, the message I send from myself to Steven, um, or any other part of the life cycle is not altered or compromised, right? Um, number three, availability uh, relates to assets and resources always being accessible by those authorized users, right? So um, I like to use the example of uh, a doctor, right? A doctor or a pharmacist sending prescriptions or any research or whatever, whatever you have somewhere else, right? So say if I go to the doctor's office, um, they send a prescription to a pharmacy, right? They use a portal, they use an application to get that prescription from point A to point B. Um, in any event, if a network is compromised, if an application is compromised, on our end to ensure availability of cybersecurity professionals, we add layers, right? Layers of availability. So if that application does go down, do we have a failover system so that the doctor, the pharmacist, and the patient don't even notice that the network is down, don't even notice that application has gone down, um, but we have those failover procedures in place, right? Um, so that is what the basis of cybersecurity is for any program um, or any organization, right? History of cybersecurity. So we're gonna talk about ARPANET, we're gonna talk about Creeper, and we're gonna talk about Reaper, right? ARPANET was a precursor to the internet. Um, it was developed by the Advanced Research Projects Agency um, and this network was basically just computers connected through telephone lines, right? Um, and as a part of this research, Creeper, which is a worm, was developed, right? Um, looking at this worm in a way that it, the way the payload was displayed across the network, you would think it was malicious, but it wasn't. It was a part of the research. Um, and a researcher from uh, Raytheon BVN Technologies, it had another name prior to be, being called that, um, a researcher from that company created this worm. Now a worm is a self replicating set of code, right? So once the worm is executed or once the worm is on a system or a network, it replicates, right? And it replicates across the network to different systems, to different devices, to uh, different, anything that's connected to that network, it's gonna self replicate, right? Um, being that this wasn't malicious, it didn't cause any destru destruction. Um, the only payload, which is basically what the output of the code is, was a display on all the computer screens saying, I'm the creeper, catch me if you can, all right? So that is our first instance of a virus or worm uh, in cybersecurity. Um, in 1973, so this was in 1971 with the creeper. In 1973, Reaper was created by a researcher from ARPANET, right? They created this, what we call the first cybersecurity program. Its job was basically to scour ARPANET for any, uh, any residual or any, any uh, how you say, any aspect of creeper on a computer or on a network, right? Um, so this is just basically threefold, precursor to the internet, ARPANET, uh, Creeper, which was the first worm, um, and Reaper, which we kind of classify as the first cybersecurity software program. Uh, moving right into cybercrime, um, we're gonna start by talking about the types of threat actors, right? Um, we have script kitties, we have hacktivists, we have nation state actors, and we have white, gray, black hats. There's different type of hats. They have green, blue, red, but these are, uh, these are the most talked about. These are the most prominent, right? White, gray, or black hats, right? So starting with script kitties, these are amateur hackers. Um, these are the hackers that just find code, uh, the malicious code, and they just, they just uh, input it anywhere, execute it anywhere, just for the fun of it, right? I can relate that to a real life example of, I know when I was growing up, we used to play with fireworks. We lit fireworks, we do them in the street, we watch them blow up. That's all you want to do, right? That's what a script kitty does. They grab the code, they execute it, and they just watch it work, right? That's what a script kitty is, an amateur hacker. Um, hacktivists are individuals who have some type of uh, motivation, right? They're motivated uh, by political or social gains. Um, these, can, these type of threat actors can take the shape of religious organizations. Uh, political groups and social justice groups. Um, a prime example or a real world example, I wanna say from last year in Iran, um, this hacktivist group basically, I think they had issues with the government or uh, something that had to do with gas and, and, and um, different financial situations, but 
they actually hacked into a credit system or credit card or debit card system, which was a subsidized credit card or debit card that um, uh, individuals from Iran would use at gas pumps, right? So what they did was they disabled, they disabled the ability for these uh, individuals to use those cards at the gas pumps and they displayed a message um, basically going against the government, right? So this is a real world example of what a hacktivist organization is sometimes, you know, you will have social groups that just, they have a cause, right? And they'll deface a website. They'll take a website and place their logo up there or they'll try to, um, another example will be um, trying to disrupt the network, right? Disrupt the network of, uh, of an opposing party that you're not really uh, going, going against, right? So moving on to nation state actors, these nation state actors are the threat actors that are responsible for the breaches that we usually see in the news, right? Um, uh, speaking to these individuals or groups, they're usually government funded. So specific to the conflict that we see going on now, um, you will have Russian sponsored um, nation state actors, right? These are small hacking groups. They can be big or small. Um, you'll have the same thing in Ukraine and, and any other countries, right? Organization, countries usually fund these type of threat actors, right? Um, these threat actors target private and public sector organizations to destruct to cause destruction, to destroy, to change, to steal data, information, resources, trade secrets. Um, and um, speaking about private sector and public sector, I would say in America, uh, probably 70% or more of the critical infrastructure in, in America is uh, owned by the private sector, um, which is uh, one reason why you know, thinking about what's going on in today's world with the conflict, um, our jobs as cybersecurity professionals, um, our number one job is to make sure that this critical infrastructure is secure and safe. Um, and that encompasses a lot of work with private sector um, organizations, right? We have public sector organizations, we have the government, we have the FBI, we have CISA, which is one of the organizations that I actually uh, mentioned earlier, but um, the biggest job for us is really to protect critical infrastructure. Um, and that goes back to what nation state actors usually target, right? Especially in America. Um, moving right along to white, gray, and black hats. White hats are usually ethical hackers. These are the hackers that uh, companies or organizations usually employ to do like pen testing, to uh, test out security controls. Everything is contractual. Um, the tactics and the tools that they use, they'll let you know that they're gonna use them before they actually deploy any uh, code or any, use any of these tools. Um, and it it's with explicit permission, right? Um, these white hat hackers, and I will say all of these different hackers, they're exploiting vulnerabilities and security flaws, but most of the time with white hat hackers, they're doing it in a safe environment, right? Um, moving on to black hat hackers. This is on the other end of the spectrum. These are those hackers or threat actors that have malicious intent. Um, they wanna steal, they wanna destroy, they wanna cause destruction, right? Um, and a gray hat is a mix between them both, right? So gray hats are usually those individuals that have the skills to hack, they have the skills to um, be a white, hacker, a white hat hacker or a black hat hacker. But what they do is they'll employ these skills, they'll hack an organization without letting the organization know and they'll take it to a point where they're not causing any destruction or stealing anything. Um, and they'll take those findings and say, hey, this is what we found. This is, these are the security flaws. Um, thank you. Thank you for allowing us to talk to you. Can we please get 50K? You know, <laughs> that's how I usually have this with uh, gray hat hackers, right? So you have your white hat hackers, they're ethical. Um, they go by contracts, they have engagements. These are like professional services firms that are hired out by organizations to test those uh, security flaws and controls. Um, gray hat, or oh, black hat on the other end of the spectrum. And then we have the gray hats that are kind of in the, in the middle. All right, so we're gonna talk about types of attacks, right? We have malware, we have ransomware, viruses, zero day exploits uh, and DOS or DDoS attacks. Um, these are just some of the most popular attacks. There, there are many more and they're growing by the day, um, but Malware is short for malicious software. Um, it's used for stealing or destroying computers and computer networks, right? So there are different types. You have Trojan horse uh, attacks or malware. 
these are those, these are, this is the code that hackers use to get into an organization and keep the door open, right? So um, what usually happens is with malware, you will have Trojan horses combined with logic bombs, combined with key loggers, combined with rootkits, all these things packaged into one um, actual campaign or actual attack, right? Um, talking about this Trojan horse again, it's a backdoor. It allows hackers to always maintain access, right? Logic bombs are usually uh, scheduled or scheduled attacks, right? So say if I'm an employee um, on a security team, I know I'm getting fired next week. Um, on Monday, I'm going to go into the office. I'm going to set up some code. I'm going to, as soon as I get the letter of termination, you know, boom, the whole organization shuts down or the network shuts down, right? So that's the logic bomb, right? It's a time bomb. Sometimes it'll, it'll have different um, triggers, right? So the trigger can be um, an email that I received with a certain subject, and that triggers off a domino effect of events. Um, key loggers, basically, they track your keystrokes, right? So if I have a key logger on a computer um, or in a network or on a server, um, I'll be able to track what to type in, usually to harvest credentials or passwords. Um, Rootkits. Uh, basically cloak all of these different things, right? So the rootkit will, what happens with rootkits that you'll see a lot, um, you'll have, as a security team, you'll have all these different controls in place. You'll have uh, controls in place or detection software. You'll have prevention software. What a rootkit does um, is hide all of these different uh, malware, right? Um, so, I won't know as a security professional, I won't know if there's a Trojan horse, right? Because of the rootkit, I won't know if there's a logic bomb ticking waiting to be uh, uh, executed. I won't know if key loggers are on the system, right? Um, so that's what a rootkit is for. Ransomware is malware. Um, it's just malware that's used to for financial gain, right? So malware, this malware will actually um, come onto your network. Um, it'll encrypt your files, right? Or it'll, it'll encrypt any of your resources or your assets, right? Whatever those may be. Um, and once encrypted, um, the hackers will request ransom, right? It's just like a robber kidnapping a person or a robber taking some jewels or whatever the case is, and then they request ransom, right? Um, usually in the form of cryptocurrency. Um, with this ransomware, uh, you'll have organizations, again, like CISA or any of these other organizations that like federal organizations and they kind of provide guidance on what you should do a lot of times you'll have these organizations say don't pay the ransom or pay the ransom or let's do some more research or how how compromised are you have they gotten all your assets do we really need to think about paying it so that that's uh something else to uh keep in mind when it comes to ransomware and um insurance is another thing with ransomware right you want to have as an organization to uh kind of counteract ransomware, you want to make sure you have insurance, right? Having insurance sometimes ensures that no matter what happens, you'll be covered, right? Um, moving along to viruses. Viruses are also malicious code. I would say viruses usually just for destruction, usually not for any gain or ransomware. Um, zero day exploits are the type of attacks that um, hackers basically exploit, right? Before a cybersecurity professional or a cybersecurity te team can actually um, remediate, right? So I was this this type of attack um, was evident. I want to say with Solar Winds, more or less with Solar Winds. Um, I think that was in the news. I don't know if you guys heard about it, but the hackers actually used malicious code to input it into software that was being released by Solar Winds to all their customers, right? So SolarWinds releases these patches. That's what we call patches when we're making these updates, right? Um, all these customers are using a software update that has a malicious code, and that, it, that creates more of a, a, a landscape for attackers to use, right? Um, and I think we'll talk more about zero-day exploits. DOS or DDoS attacks, denial of service, or distributed denial of service, are basically attacks that are propagated by hackers flooding a system with traffic, right? When you flood a system with traffic, if you don't have the proper controls in place, um, a system basically, in layman's terms, a system can basically become overwhelmed, right? Um, and when overwhelmed, it'll shut down, it'll cause disruption in service. Um, 
you'll find that networks are compromised. You'll find that applications are shutting down. You'll find that, you know, you can't access email. All those things happen just off of denial of service attacks, right? Um, distributed denial of service attacks. These attacks are on a larger scale. So what happens with denial of service is basically you're flooding a network, right? With distributed denial of service attacks, you're actually compromising other systems. You're creating an army of computers and then you're actually flooding a computer or a network a little bit more than you would with a typical denial of service attack, right? We call those bots, right? Those, those computers that become compromised as a part of the DDoS attack, we call those bots that become a part of a botnet. A botnet is like an army of computers, right? The hacker sits behind one computer, masked by another computer that is controlling this army. And that is what initiates that, uh, bot, that uh, denial of service attack, right? Uh, types of attack continue, continue. Social engineering we're finding is one of the, uh, one of the more prominent ones. Um, social engineering exploits humans within organizations to gain information or data that can be used for illegitimate purposes. Um, in cybersecurity, we say that humans and organization or employees can be the weakest point of entry or the strongest point of defense, right? Depending on how aware your, your users are and how, um, how strong of an infamous emphasis you place on user awareness and user training. Um, phishing is a type of e uh, attack where hackers use emails um, to actually infiltrate a network or compromise the organization. Um, I send an email to an individual as a hacker um, saying that I'm the CEO of the organization. Um, please send me a thousand dollars or please let me know what your password is. I'm at, a, I'm at a meeting, I'm about to present in 20 minutes, um, which is creating a sense of urgency, right? So an employee that is not aware of what's going on with the CEO, what's going on with that type of email, um, that sense of urgency further promotes the, the uh, aspect of providing a CEO, so-called CEO, your password, or um, providing some type of financial gain, right? Um, I will say actually last a uh, few days ago, actually last week, I was speaking to um, uh, an associate of mine um, and they basically, they, they work for this other organization. They're not in cyber, it's just somebody that I know real well. And they were telling me about an instance that they actually just experienced. Um, they work directly with a CEO of a company. The CEO, the so-called CEO sent the email. The email looked like it was coming from the CEO. Um, and not to say that she was gullible, but to someone that you know has no knowledge of what cyber security is or what a spam can look, uh, what what a scam can look like, um, you know, it's easy just to fall for that, right? So she actually ended up using her credit card to purchase a thousand dollars worth of Apple gift cards. Um, yeah, so it's uh, she told me and I heard the story. You know, and it's I think of it like this: if I if as a hacker, if I shoot out that email to five thousand individuals, I'm at least going to get one response, right? If I'm lucky, right? And if I shoot it out to ten thousand individuals, I'm probably going to get two or three. That's three thousand dollars that I just got just by sending an email. You know what I'm saying? So that's that's the level of that's the level of social engineering, right? And phishing, spear phishing are campaigns that are a little bit more focused. So if I, as a hacker, am going to employ spear phishing, I'm going to um, say, Stephen, I guess I'll use you again, for example. <laughs> say, hey, Stephen, right? Uh, I'll look at his LinkedIn profile. I'll see where he works. I'll go on his social media to see if he has any dogs, cats, see if he posts his birthday. I'll see if he has any family. Um, and this is just the thought process for me, right? Um, I'll, see, I'll see if I can connect with him. I'll see if he provides me information, All right? So now I know where he works. I know uh, information from his social media, whether it's his birthday, it's his, where he's from, his uh, parents' names. And as a hacker, I will use that information to either coerce him through phishing, which is social engineering, or I'll create a dictionary. There's these attacks where you can use dictionaries. I can plug in information that I've pulled from him and it'll test maybe a thousand different passwords, right? Using his birthday, his dog's name, um, the year that we're currently in, president anything right and those are those are just the type of attacks that's how sophisticated it can get right um vishing is the use of phone calls with the same malicious malicious intentions as phishing right so i'm pretty sure everybody in here has gotten phone calls 
spam phone calls. Those phone calls usually are used to uh, elicit information, right? It could be, um, you can let me know your name, you know, anything. Any little thing is enough information to move in the right direction when it comes to hacking, right? The same thing for smishing. That's the use of text messages, right? I know for me, for an example, I get text messages from random numbers saying, click this link or, hey, this is uh, Bank of America. We just need you to verify the code that we sent from this, verify the code that we sent from um, this other phone number. Please send us that code. But it's actually a hacker using your information to log into your account, which has a second level of authentication, which is a code, right? And they're asking for that code, right? Um, question. I've gotten that same phone call. I'm <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's it's always good to verify. I think that's the biggest thing with cybersecurity or anything like vishing or smishing or phishing, any of those issues, those you want to verify or validate, right? Validation is key, right? If you get a phone call from Amazon, check your account, call Amazon, right? Um and those calls are just or text messages are just basically to gather information, right? Oh, that's another big one. That's another big one. Yeah. Just block. You can just block those numbers. <laughs> I would say anything with anything like that. It's all about validation, right? You want to validate, validate, validate always, right? And farming, um, farming is the last type of attack we'll talk about here. Farming basically targets users uh, when it comes to websites, right? So say, for example, I have a social media account as a hacker. It's a fake account. Uh, I send Stephen a direct message, right? I say, hey, look at this opportunity to become a pharmacist at this organization and make this certain amount of money. Click on this link, provide your name, your number, your email address, and we'll get back to you immediately, right? That's what farming is, right? And you're basically building up, again, that information, right? Collecting information. You'll collect as much as you can. Some people might give you their password. Some people might give you their social security. But again, name, number, birthday, email address, sometimes that's enough, right? Um, so this is an example of phishing, right? This is an email from Global Pay to David, right? The subject is restore your account. And we can make this a little interactive if you guys want, right? We got the date here. We have an attachment, one attachment, uh, seven kilobytes. We have a save button, quick look. Looking at the message here, it says, dear customer, we regret to inform you that your account has been restricted. To continue using our services, please download, I wanna reiterate the word download, the file attached to this email and update your login information. Um, and this is the download right here, right? So looking at this, um, looking at this, I, if, if anybody wants to give it a shot to explain any aspect of this email that looks a little funny or, or iffy. The download request, right? So as an individual, or even as a cybersecurity professional, I've never had to download anything to, uh, what is it? To change my password or update my account or unblock my account. I just, I just never had to do that, right? Even before I even thought about getting into IT or cybersecurity, right? So that's one red flag. Um, another red flag for me as a cybersecurity professional would just be the format of this message, right? Um, I would also look at, I would also look at the subject, restore your account. Um, and I think honestly, that is the only thing. The download is the biggest thing for me. That, that's an automatic red flag. Um, if you ever receive that to your personal work email, you can automatically flag that as phishing, delete it, block the contact, right? Question. Exactly. That's another one. Dear customer, right? First or last name, or even the way that dear customer is I just don't think that is looking like a actual, I, would, I don't know. I'm not an English major, but capitalizing the C or not using a customer, I don't know. Something, it just doesn't look right, right? Another example we have here, all right? First thing that pops out, Netflix for me, right? Um, sorry about the actual email address at the top looking a little bit smaller, but I'll re read the actual email address to you. 
Um, this is coming from Team Netflix, right? The actual email address is no reply, this mail or ID 33 at I E U W G F I U W E G F I dot com. Right, but we're looking at Netflix, right? So that's that's the first red flag. I don't even have to look past this, but let's continue to look, right? Automatic payment, high customer, your auto payment cannot process. Your subscription period will end on Wednesday, January 22nd, 2020, right? I would also look at the urgency of this email and the date that it was sent. It was sent on the same date. Um, and I would think that a company like Netflix would probably harbor on me a little bit before the actual date that I was supposed to pay, right? Um, the click here button, that's also something that's fishy. Um, I would say, I don't know if I included it here, but if you ever hover over a link, all right, you don't have to click it. Just put your mouse on it. You'll see the actual link. Um, and that usually will let you know if you're going to go somewhere actually that is Netflix related or, um, actually related to the website. Right. Um, and let's move on to. Let's move on to another one, right? So this one right here, right? This is from, and again, sorry about the small text, but this is, I see PayPal, right? So first thing I'm thinking is PayPal. The from PayPal, right? The address is paypal at notice-access-273.com, right? That right there is another red flag, right? Uh, looking at, let's see what else we have here. Yeah, there's not too much more. There's not too much more for this, but those are just some of the red flags that you want to uh, avoid. Mm -hmm. um, one of our sister organizations, another chapter, Royal Counties, I got um, uh, a schedule of CD programs mm -hmm. for the month. And it asked about payment. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to not, I don't have. Uh, PayPal account. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the option was yes. Mm. And to me, the red flag was it came up in a foreign language. Ah, oh, okay. Okay. Yeah, see that that but that can be from a legitimate mm -hmm. pharmacy chapter. Mm -hmm. And I I have no idea if it was malicious or not. Right, right. But I used to click after I saw the foreign yeah. language. Yeah. <laughs> so I don't know. Is that a sign? Uh, you know, the, the biggest thing for me, I say, if you don't know, then just assume that it's it's automatically malicious, right? The worst thing that can happen is that you're not going to pay something or you can validate. I think number one, the number one thing is always, always validate, right? Um, if you receive an email, if the even if the email address looks correct, that sometimes can be a compromised account, right? So if somebody actually is using a valid email address, that, that doesn't mean that it's coming from somebody sitting behind that email address that is who the person says they are, right? So it can be a compromised account. It's always good to validate, right? Don't feel bad when you're trying to validate or if you call in PayPal or Amazon or even your sister chapter and trying to validate if uh, an email is real. You know, it's, it's better to be safe than sorry, always. Any more questions about this before we move on? Okay. Um, enterprise security, I'll just run through this real quick. This is just a organizational structure that you will usually see across cybersecurity programs or organizations. You have your CISO, your Chief Information Security Officer who sits at the top of the organization. This is your vice president. This is the person that is the chief when it comes to cybersecurity, right? Um, you have your incident response team. You have your vulnerability management and remediation team your SOC, your security architecture team, and your governance, risk, and compliance team. Sometimes these teams, the naming might be, look different, but the responsibilities are pretty much the same. Incident response and SOC, they usually go hand in hand. Um, incident response are the team, team that you go to for a cyber breach or anything that is happening cybersecurity related. They're the, they're the boots on the ground, right, for breaches, right? If they see something on a network that looks fishy or something that's not um, correlating to behavior that is normal, this is the team that handles that. And the SOC also, the Security Operations Center, right? That's what the SOC is. These are those individuals that you will see sitting behind a computer, green and black screens. If you they want to imagine some a cybersecurity professional that is doing that, that's what the SOC does. They just sit there and monitor the network, 
they triage any events that might look a little fishy. And sometimes they'll correlate with the incident response team who actually handles those investigations, right? So you can think of the SOC as uh, your local patrol police, and you can think of incident response as like detectives, right? Um, vulnerability management and remediation. This is the team responsible for uh, identifying security flaws and providing information for patching vulnerabilities. Um, you have your security architecture team responsible for the design and maintenance of an organization's security environment. Um, and you have your governance, risk, and compliance team. They're responsible for ensuring that the organization, as well as the security team, are abiding by uh, any regulatory uh, standards or industry standards, uh, like HIPAA. Or uh, they also usually are responsible for the policies, the information security policy and procedure for organization. Right? Those policies define the program of security for organization top down. Right. Uh, moving right along, this framework, NIST, uh, the NIST Cybersecurity Framework, NIST stands for National Institute of Standards and Technology. This framework is used probably nine, time, nine out of 10 organizations or security programs align their security program to this framework, right? These five different aspects of identify assets or resources, protect those assets or resources, detect any behavior that is not normal or any uh, cyber breaches, responding to those breaches or behavior that's not normal and recovering from any incidents, right? So identifying assets um, within healthcare that may be uh, patient data or trade secrets or any clinical research, um, you wanna be able to identify those assets, right? And to be able to protect those assets, you have to be able to identify those. Protection just goes into the controls that you have around protecting those assets. Um, detecting are those detective measures, right? The SOC team, they employ different tools and tactics to uh, be able to monitor the network and detect if there is any behavior or any, uh, any strange behavior on the network or any breaches or any hackers compromising the network. Um, you have your responsive uh, procedures um, as incident response team, right? They'll, they'll be responsible for uh, responding to any incidents and recovering, being able to recover from any incident, as well as taking lessons from the incident and, um, you know, trying to rebuild your program and make your program better. Um, this is a diagram of a security network in a nutshell. Sitting at the top is the internet, right, or the cloud. Um, this is basically, I would say, for an individual like me that works remotely, um, this is how I get into anything that relates to my organization. I'm coming from the internet, right? From that internet, I'll hit a firewall. Uh, through that firewall, I can get in with my password. I have to verify that I am who I say I am to get into my internal network, right? I hit a router, right? A router basically just directs traffic. Sometimes this traffic, well, from here, this is another firewall, right? So you see this defense in depth, right? You got a firewall for me coming in to get into the router to hit another firewall, right? Here is ADS, stands for Active Directory Server or Services. Um, this is the aspect of the organization that houses all your user accounts, right? So um, coming in, I hit this firewall, I hit the router, I come here, I, hit my, I enter my password, I enter my username, this firewall says I'm good to go. I come in and I can access the FTP server. All these, these are assets, right? These are all the assets. Um, we have another firewall. Usually you have this double firewall scenario when you have assets that are a little bit more critical and you wanna uh, just provide another layer of protection, right? Over here, this server is a honeypot, right? This honeypot is basically a staging for any behavior or any network traffic that comes into the organization that we think may be malicious, but we have to test it out and see, right? So if there's something coming in from the internet or outside the organization, into the firewall, it's made it past the router, it's hit another firewall, there's two firewalls, the firewall or whatever's here, all right? Still saying that the traffic still is a little fishy. We'll send it to the honeypot, right? A honeypot, you can do anything in a honeypot. You can execute the code, you can blow up that machine or that honeypot. And then at that point, you'll know if it's malicious or not, right? And if not, you can just send it out of the honeypot back into your network, right? That's like high level, all right? So moving into cyber breaches, I'm going to talk just about a breach um, attributed to Russia, right? 
the target was Ukraine, right? This attack um, included ransomware and malware, right? Um, motive destruction, the motives here was destruction and to frighten anyone doing business with Ukraine, right? Indicator of compromise, IOC or indicator of compromise, um, encryption of system files, uh, a reboot and a display of a message below, right? So this indicator of compromise consisted of a payload that encrypted the files on a system. It rebooted the computer. And upon the computer uh, coming back online, this is a message that was displayed saying that your computer, your files are encrypted. Um, you have to pay us a ransom, right? Um, this breach was widespread. Uh, again, speaking to the conflict now, this, I think this conflict has been going on for years now. It stems, I don't even wanna get into the whole where it stems from and all that good stuff, but uh, basically with this breach, it spilled over to a lot of different organizations. Um, and outcome, all right? This is one of the biggest breaches I would say probably in cybersecurity history. Um, the cost of damage total globally was $10 billion. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much it for this one. Moving right along, another, another cybersecurity breach uh, with Winti malware, similar to uh, the attack in 2017. Um, uh, it uh, affected Bayer, Roche, and a few other organizations. These organizations actually were lucky because they were attacked, but they didn't lose anything. Their assets actually weren't compromised. They didn't lose any data, as to we know of, right? That's what they reported um, today, you know? So we're just gonna go with that, right? Um, the targets, diversified targets, they didn't really have any specific target, right? They targeted pharmaceutical companies, telecoms companies, software, technology, and political organizations. Uh, the motivations here was espionage and stealing trade secrets. Um, the indicator of compromise was, was data exfiltration. There were a lot of different indicators of compromise, but I think that was the biggest one. Um, data exfiltration basically mean that, means that hackers get into a system or a network. They're taking this data that they can either use to um, sell on the dark web. The dark web is just a place for um, hackers to go to to sell anything, right? Data being one of them. Um, and the outcomes were no law, was no loss. Like I said, to date, Bayer uh, and the other organization uh, hasn't reported any loss to date. And we're gonna move into cyber hygiene. I think this is some of the, uh, some of the most important stuff or some of the most critical stuff that we can talk about. Um, and it's fun stuff also, right? Cause you, you, you think about social media, you think about LinkedIn, you think about Instagram, Twitter, Snapchat, um, Hackers use these platforms to gather information, like I mentioned. Um, they leverage it to execute uh, phishing campaigns, social engineering, or systematically guessing passwords based on factors, like I mentioned, with birth dates, family, pets, hobbies. Um, talking about LinkedIn, LinkedIn is used by threat actors who, po who's, who pose as legitimate professionals in your industry to gain insight into you and your organization. Right, so I know for me as a cybersecurity professional, um, I'm getting probably about five to 10 uh, either requests a day from individuals, um, most of who want to know exactly what we're doing in our organization as far as our security program. Um, there are also those that'll reach out like they're recruiters, right? And that's a method of gathering information. They'll say, hey, I'm a recruiter, I'm working on this role. Um, let's schedule time to talk. If it gets past that stage where I actually engage in a conversation, then they'll ask, you know, okay, what tools do you use? Um, you know, how mature is your security program? Um, I know you work on this team. What tools do you employ, right? Providing information. At this point, with that information, they can go back and say, hey, okay, I know that they use this Microsoft service um, and this vulner vulnerability came out, you know, and I'm pretty sure they haven't patched it. So let me go check and see. Let me run some scans. Let me check and see if this is an exploit or a path into the organization, right? Again, talking to the sophistication of these attacks, right? All it takes is just being able to put these different things together. Um, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat accounts have been compromised in several ways to include presenting a financial opportunity to gain bank or credit card information, um, social media account credentials, um, there are different ways that these financial opportunities are presented. I know on Instagram or LinkedIn or any other social media platform, they'll say, 
Um, I know Bitcoin or Forex is a big one. You know, a lot of people will use that as a, a way to leverage um, passwords or have someone actually contribute financially. Um, and uh, I also mentioned being tagged in random social media posts. Um, usually this kind of caters to farming. Farming, again, is actually using a website to uh, trick individuals into providing information, right? So I can speak to Instagram, right? There are Instagram posts where there may be about 50 plus users tagged, right? Just casting that wide net. Out of those 50 users that I actually tag into a photo, right? Or a post, um, at least one person might buy it, right? The photo or post is taking that individual to a, a website where I'm asking them for information, like their first name, last name, um, or even asking them to purchase a service. Something that's appeasing, right? Being able to appeal to a human's sense of whatever they like, you know, is an easy entry into uh, grabbing credentials or credit card information or bank information, right? Um, so just some good security measures, measures for social media. Refrain, refrain from providing any sensitive information. Um, that can usually relate from, it's hard with first name and last name, you know, with LinkedIn, um, but any information about your birthday, it's, it's okay, right? Uh, anything about your, anything about, anything that can be used to compromise any of your information or your accounts, right? I know, again, thinking of in the way of a hacker, um, usually what, usually with bank accounts or accounts of that nature, they'll ask you three questions, right? So your families, where you were born, the city, your mom, met your dad, and your pet's name, right? Being able to retrieve that information from social media is the easy, another easy entry point. I don't have to, I don't have to worry about figuring out a malicious code or a virus or a worm, you know, that's beyond some people's um, um, knowledge, right? So if I'm able to gather that information through social media, I can give it a shot, right? Um, and people literally do this all day. You know, if they're doing this 24 seven, you know, they're not on a 40 hour work week. They're waking up and trying to, you know, they're waking up and trying to hack all day. You know, this is what they do. I work eight, eight hours a day, sometimes longer, you know, but people that are malicious, they, they wake up and they do this, right? Um, you also want to limit, like I said, limiting personal information, um, the use of complex passwords and enabling MFA. Um, MFA is multi-factor authentication. What that looks like is me entering a password to get into a system um, and also having a second factor of authentication, right? So something I know, right? There's different factors of authentication. Something I know, something I have, which can be a, a token, a RSA token or a, a authenticator app or something I am or something. It's always something that relates to you, right? Or something that you have in your own possession. We're gonna talk about that a little bit. Um, this is an example of a compromised account. This is actually one of my good friends' actual social media page. Um, and this is, I think this is with the Forex scam, right? How they got into his uh, actual Instagram account, I actually have no idea. He doesn't know. He didn't have multi-factor authentication enabled on his Instagram profile, right? So he woke up one day and we're in a group chat and he's like, yo, I can't access my account. But I see these posts going up. And we go to his page and we see, we see this bank account with $96,000 and I'm like, okay, like I said something I need to know as your friend, I don't know. So, <laughs> but basically his account was compromised. How, we don't know. Um, he doesn't have a way back into his account, right? He reached out, reached out to Instagram, um, still no response. Um, usually what they do, they'll go, once they get into your account, they'll change all the information like phone number, email address, so that any of those communications about your account being compromised goes to the hack, right? Um, so yeah, just a prime example. And passwords, talking about passwords, talking about passwords, password complexity, right? I'm not gonna really run through all of this, but the, what I really wanted us to pay attention to is just these passwords and these passwords, right? These passwords on the bottom are less secure, right? You have one word, you have some numbers and you have a symbol. For some individuals, this might look like a secure password, but I can tell you that this right here is probably one of the easiest winter 2022 
Like these are just passwords I, I know that people use because I work with it on a daily basis. <laughs> so people use, they'll use their first name. Like for me, I see a lot, Lamar, one, two, three, exclamation point, right? That's just the easiest way in, you know? So what hackers will do, they'll take these simple passwords. They have a tool. It'll have these passwords in that tool, but it'll be about 50,000 entries, right? And they run that, they spray accounts, right? They call it password spraying. Um, and they'll actually, test that login to a list of usernames, right? So if I take everybody's Gmail account in this room, I'll only test it one time. Because if I test it more than once, um, you know, nine times out of 10, the account is gonna lock out, you're gonna get a security alert. So I'll take password one, two, three, exclamation, and I'll run it past everybody's uh, account in here. Maybe I'll get lucky, maybe I won't, right? Um, but if you take that and multiply it by, I'm gonna test uh, 100,000 users of an organization, password one, two, three, uh, exclamation, I promise you, I, I'll probably get one, at least one, you know? Um, so that just, again, to the sophistication. So you wanna always try to steer away from this. You wanna include 15 plus characters, um, lowercase, uppercase, numbers, and special characters. For me, I, I've, I made these up because LT, that's my initials, if I had Citibank, I would include that in there to kind of help me remember what the password is. 2022, that's the year at pound that. That's just a sequence of special characters. For me, I don't think this is secure. This is secure for me, but this is okay, right? <laughs> <laughs> this, we want to stay away from those. Um, you also want to avoid password duplicates across systems. I'm guilty of that, right? I use the same, I at one point used the same password for all my accounts, right? Um, until I got into the field and I understood what that meant. So you wanna steer away from that. Um, it's, it's not a bad thing. It's not the worst thing in the world, but as even from leaving from here today, if you can, any new accounts that you take on, just try to use passwords that are different than what you're used to, right? Um, to help with that, you can uh, use password managers. I personally use a password manager called LastPass. I don't know any of my passwords usually that, that software actually manages my password, right? So it can rotate the passwords for me. I can say I want a password that has 15 plus characters, special characters, lower and uppercase. Um, and yeah, these are just a few, right? LastPass is a good one. If you guys wanna invest in that, it's free. It's free, it's free. Multi-factor authentication, you, whenever and wherever possible, you wanna leverage multi-factor authentication. Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of us in here may use that for our work. So if you're logging into your network or your internal network, you enter your password, you might have an authenticator app or you might be sent a code to your text message to your phone. Um, that's the second level of authentication, right? They usually call that 2FA, right? But you can have multi-factor, you can have more than two, three, whatever is considered secure for your organization, right? Um, there are applications for that. You have Google Authenticator. I have, I have all three of those actually. Um, but yeah, if you have questions about that, I can help you guys get set up with that. Um, cyber hygiene continue, use of VPN on personal computers. Um, I'll just run through these and we'll ask any, if you have any questions about any app that we can talk through them. Use of antivirus and anti-malware software. That's just some of the software that can be used. Um, ensuring that your internet service providers manage updates for your hardware. Usually internet service providers are good, good with that. Verizon, Spectrum, they're usually good with keeping up. Uh, to date with their hardware. Um, avoid clicking links and emails. Um, ensuring that computer use is monitored and profiles or user accounts are assigned per individual. Um, what that means basically, if you're living in a household with five individuals and you have one computer, you set up user accounts for each user so that no user is just using each other's account, right? So you don't have any spillover in activity um, as long as you're the only person that knows your password and you're in a household with one computer and five individuals, um, you know that any activity taken or any action taken on your profile has been done by you, right? Um, another, another one, locking your computer or laptop when you walk away from your workstation. I was guilty of this. When I leave my workstation at work, I just leave my computer open. Um, you wanna just get in the habit of also locking your, your workstation. Um, depending on what type of computer you have, you can look up what, it mean, what you have to do to lock it, right? Um, that caters to insider threats. You'll have individuals and organizations that are malicious, but they're employees, right? So you wanna cover your own back at the end of the day, right? Um, schedule and perform, go ahead, question? Well, 
Um, my question is, somebody told me, I'm a relative tech, mm -hmm. you know, so neophyte. Mm -hmm. I don't have personal internet access or anything like that. Mm -hmm. But they said, if you buy any of these antivirus, anti-malware software, specifically they, they specified McAfee and mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They didn't mention Kaspersky or malware bytes. Um, they said basically they hook you. Yeah, they do. So that if you no longer subscribe, mm -hmm. you get infected. Not necessarily. What I what I will say is that they have a lot of what we call bloatware, right? So they have a lot of ads. Like you said, they'll if you don't subscribe, you're gonna get pop-ups. Um, they I don't want to say that they'll leave your network open because that's illegal. Um, but they won't protect your computer anymore, right? So it's better to have even if you have the basic level of Norton and McAfee. I don't use I don't use McAfee. I don't use Norton just out of personal preference. But again, there that's a level of protection, right? If you don't have anything, it's better than having nothing. But I don't I don't want to say they hook you as much as they 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 want to ensure that you stay their customers and nobody else's, right? Um, but if you do have a situation like that, I would definitely report them. <laughs> that's not that's not legal, all right? So uh, and scheduling and performing regular backups of data. Um, if you have a computer, if you're attacked or your computer is attacked, personal or work, um, the easiest way to get back up and running is just to restore backup, right? If I'm attacked today, but I took a backup at 12 p.m. today, I can assure that I have everything that I did from 12 p.m. today back, right? Um, uh, and I think that's the summary. We'll skip past that. Um, so yeah, again, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure being here. If you guys want to go into any questions, Q and A. Yes. You have time for Q and A? Okay. okay thank you. So thank you, Lamar, for that um, wonderful presentation. Before we open it up for the Q and A session, I just did want to give out the CE codes for tonight's event. So the CE codes for pharmacist is practice, practice with a capital P, and the CE code for any technicians who are here or are joining virtually is incident, I-N-C-I-D-E-N-T. All right, so now we can open it up for any questions or answers and stuff for Lamar. Any questions, feel free to ask. Hmm? Um, I think those password managers, what year is that? Is yeah. Okay. Now that, that's a valid fear. So the question was, or the comment was that um, we talked about password managers, and her fear was that those password managers can get compromised, which would in turn compromise every account that she has in that password manager. Um, I think when it comes to password managers, you basically want to do your research. A lot of these, for a password manager to for them to be a, a lucrative company, they need these levels of assurance, right? So what you know, a lot of companies like LastPass will do, they'll provide that level of assurance by um, actually segregating the ability for any breach that they experience to spill over to their uh, customers, right? Um, so that is a level of insurance. And for them to be a leading organization, they have, they have some pretty secure uh, stuff going on, but you know, that is a valid fear. And I would just say, do your research. Um, even within using those password managers, try to rotate your passwords um, as often as possible. 90 days is the requested or the general um, idea of how often you should rotate your passwords. Um, I know I don't follow that usually for a lot of my stuff, you know, but <laughs> again, like taking, if, if I know I'm not doing that, I make sure that I have 15 plus um characters i'm sure that i have special characters upper lowercase multi-factor authentication um backups all these different levels right um so yeah back to your question you know just make sure you do your research i can vouch for last pass um i can't really vouch for any of the other ones but feel free to reach out if you have any questions in, uh, about password managers Yeah, Macs are generally better with security when it comes to, um, in general, with laptops or computers, right? So Macs, they, op they operate on different operating systems, right? So 
the rule of thumb is that a Mac is more secure than a Windows, you know, but yeah, it is true. I, I, I would hold it true, but that won't stop a hacker, right? Um, but if you're looking for a more secure laptop, I would suggest, I don't use Macs. I'm a Windows guy, you know, I like, <laughs> but <laughs> I can definitely uh, agree with that one. Mm -hmm. It depends, you know, we, we talk about payloads, right? So payloads are just what happens when software is executed, right? Or when you do click on a link, right? So it can either download malware, right? Um, again, malware is destructive, right? It's code that's destructive. It can download malware that is also ransomware. It's code that's destructive, but it'll actually encrypt your files and your systems um, and then request that you pay money to get those things back, right? Um, to counteract ransomware, backups are important and they help because if files are encrypted, you'll have backups that are stored separate from where they're, the hackers were able to encrypt and you'll be able to count your losses with maybe a day's or two work to work, right? Um, so yeah. yeah. Any, any other questions? Mm -hmm. The robocalls, I mean, again, it's like gathering information, you know, it's either gathering information. Sometimes, you know, like the, the sophistication can go to a different level. Like they'll, they'll call you on a robocall, but they'll record your voice saying yes or no, so that they can use that for prompts on another call. Right. I know a lot of different things. The sophistication is wicked, you know, and that's, and that's why it's so important to just like, just be mindful of these things. Validation is key. Again, validation is like my favorite word. If, if you don't know, then. Don't even try to figure it out, you know, um, go directly to the source, whether it's the CEO, whether it's Amazon, PayPal, anything, right? Um, the purpose is always just to harvest information, right? To either use it for a destructive gain, a political gain, financial gain. Um, so yeah, I mean, that that's like the purpose. The sophistication, it gets, it gets deep, you know, but just being mindful of those things, I hope. Any more questions? I don't know if we had any from. Did you see any in the chat? Okay, cool. That's that. All good. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you guys for having. Me.